Hello everyone, today is Thursday, January 13, 2022, and this is the week in charts. I actually want to thank all you guys and girls for attending. Every week I say I'm going to make it easy to find it. <laughs> and I never get around to doing that, and I never put the banner ad up. But usually if you just go to DaveLander.com slash webinar, register, even if it's old, and you'll be good for a long, long time. I forgot to add this one in this week. But anyway, we're here. You're here. Thank you. All right, what are we going to talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions, I have a lot to say about that. Your questions on trading, your favorite stock, and or crypto picks. We'll start with crypto first. Let's wait until we get to the live charts. And if you don't mind, put a dollar sign in front of them just so I know that we're still on crypto. So what are we going to focus on? Well, the number one thing that you must do before each and every trade, and this is something I've been thinking a lot about lately. Before we do all that, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or as often summing up. Borrowing a line from Greg Morris. All predictions about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. All right, let's talk about the number one thing that you must do before every trade. And that is an emotions pre-mortem. I often talk about the post-mortem in trades. And of course, I'm going to talk a little bit about that tonight. But what's even more important than the post-mortem is the pre-mortem. And that's making sure you've got the best setup and you're feeling that F yeah and all. And even more important than that is an emotional checkup. Now, as I often say, is present Dave going to make future Dave angry? And I like what Craig in the group, in the Facebook group said, is present Craig going to make future Craig broke? And you have to do a little bit of time travel and think about how are you going to feel if the trade ends miserably, as sometimes they do. And if you're feeling a little angst and animosity or whatever, then maybe it's a trade that you shouldn't take. Now, digging a little deeper, or you to cause any future regrets. And there's a couple of future regrets that you could have. In the present, there's a fear of missing out. And that's also known as FOMO. Now, when that FOMO becomes realized, especially when you miss out on a fantastic trade that you should have taken, that becomes the reality of FOMO, the pain of missing out. So you really have to weigh now versus in. Is it a purely is it purely a FOMO trade where you just have a fear of missing out? Or is it more of something that you know if you don't take the trade, you're going to have to deal with the pain of missing out? Now, I'm not saying pass on a mediocre trade and then be pissed off because it took off without you. You have to come to grips with with reality and say you know what this wasn't that great of a trade to begin with i'm okay with it not working or it working out without me and and believe me it's it's hard but that's kind of a a case where you're you're kind of getting into that that true enlightenment not to go all freshman psychology on you but you're getting a little further up that maslow's hierarchy of needs when you finally reach that kind of self actualization point now i hate to say this but I, i'm guessing a lot of christians are like this and i guess i can currently call myself a christian but i've kind of struggled my whole life with it and at one point and it's kind of a long story but my wife foster Computer just started talking to me. <laughs> God. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, where do you see? Jo well, thank you, George. George says you rock. Where do you see? In a little while, you got post of the week. 
So stay tuned. So, you know, this is one of those things where I don't know whether I should share or not, but I'll share. I tend to, I tend to overshare. I've kind of struggled with my Christianity, and I'm guessing like most Christians do, on and off their entire lives, and, and a lot of questions we have. And one thing that kind of helped me wrap my head around it was Pascal's wager. It's kind of a long story, but my wife forced me to go to church once <laughs> after I nearly killed a family and totaled the car. And I'm like, you know, I couldn't argue with that one. And through going to church, I met someone that I became friendly with, and he taught a Bible class, and I actually ended up teaching a class at some point, at least as an assistant here and there. But one of the things that he talked about was Pascal's Wager, and that's something I never thought about. Well, Pascal's Wager, on the positive side, says this is your time spent on Earth, okay? And if you believe for that tiny, tiny, tiny bit of time, either there is a God or there's not a God, but if you believe there is a God, for argument's sake, let's assume that he does exist, then you have an eternal bliss. Now, I did look it up earlier. There is a downside to this thing, too. I guess it's like eternal damnation. But let's just assume that all you have to do is believe, and then you get eternal bliss, right? So it's a very small thing to wager if you think about it, considering the payoff. Now, a trader's wager for a, a POMO type of trade, okay, to avoid the pain of missing out. And at the last minute, I, I added this in. This is on at the yeah trades only. And as I've said a thousand times, when I'm going through my charts every night, chart after chart after chart, a couple thousand charts, the best stocks tend to jump out at me. And I tend to have that F yeah feeling. And if it takes me an hour or two and I can't find a stock to save my life, there's probably not a whole lot of action to be taken. So on the F yeah trades where you feel like you have to take it, you'd be a fool not to take it, this is your potential loss. And there is the potential for eternal bliss. Now, that's not on every trade, obviously. But as I've said before, it's like when I ride bikes by the marina and I'm looking at the sailboats, I occasionally will think, you know, if I'd have just taken that TLR Y trade that ran up two or 300 points, 1,000 shares here, 1,000 shares there, I could have bought one or two of those posts, you know, one or two of the bigger ones. So that's something that the pain of missing out can be, can be a really, really tough thing. Now, as I've said before, and I'm going to touch upon quite a bit tonight, is the perception of the future is the here and now, okay? And the reality is the future. Now, there's a whole science that wraps around this, and there's a lot of behavioral science and behavioral finance that wraps around this, too. And just to give you a couple examples, if you are, if you have things that you're looking forward to, okay, and that's one of the secrets to being happy. And and if you're like me, we all we all get a little bummed out every now and then, especially with Mark, especially this crazy business we found ourselves in. And one of the secrets to being happy is to always have something to look forward to. Have you ever looked forward to something you're really excited about it, and the reality was, eh, it really wasn't that great. Well, that's not a total loss because you did release some positive endorphins and dopamine and such thinking about that future event, looking forward to that future event. So there's two different things at work. So let's say before you go into the trade, there's a lot of excitement, but once you get into the trade, it becomes a reality. Years ago, I knew someone who was a trader, and I didn't quite see it at the time, but in hindsight, he's a very arrogant person, <laughs> to put it mildly. And he was telling me that he does the analysis and he puts on the trade, 
and then his wife does the management of the trade. And initially, I was kind of thinking, maybe kind of based on some of the things he said, that, oh, wow, you're doing all the hard work, and, and then she just comes in after you do the, everything and just manages the trade. And then he said, well, she just can't pull the trigger. Well, pulling the trigger is easy. I mean, you can ask Alec Baldwin. Is it too soon? Sorry. <laughs> anyway, it's a lot harder managing that trade and dealing with that trade and dealing with the aftermath, good or bad, I guess, of that trade than it is to put on that trade. Now, we've talked about this before, and I can't believe it's been five years. I was looking for YouTubes on my YouTube channel, Dave Leonard. I'm sorry, let me rewind that. Burp www.youtube.com slash C slash Dave Landry. And this was five years ago when I did this. Now, this is based on Steen Barger's work. And it's kind of interesting. Before going into the trade, one part of your brain is working. And then once you get into that trade, another part of your brain sort of takes over. The two U's, so to speak. And I think that's quoting. Steam bargain. When you're going into the trade, there's that excitement and the dopamines I talked about earlier. There's optimism. And then once you're in a trade, you might find yourself feeling hope. There's excitement going in. And then there's possibly boredom, enthusiasm, which, by the way, is my second favorite asm. What's number one? Oh. I'm sorry, sarcasm is my second favorite asm. Enthusiasm is my first. <laughs> that joke didn't work, did it? And you're all excited going into the trade, but then you can find yourself in a state of fear or regret, right? There's promise and then there's reality. There's known and then there's unknown. And I think it was Montier said that stress goes up when information is unknown or changing. Well, that sounds like 8.30 Central Time when the opening bell rings, right? There's a lot of logic that can go into a trade. Okay, we've got a nice trend here, accelerating trade. This is an actual trade I think we took. This is a TKO, as you can plainly see. And then there's emotions when you're dealing with the reality of it. Everything on the left is a bit statistical, a little bit more left brain on the left, right? A little bit more right brain on the right. You might be a little irrational and emotional. There's a bit of certainty on the left. You could see this stock has gone up. You could see this stock had made a trend following a TKO, a trend following moron pattern, TKO. Yeah, that was the joke, Stuart. I just kind of I messed it up. And then once you're in the trade, there's the uncertainty. Well, information, stress, as I just said, comes when information is uncertain or changing or unknown. Well, everything's kind of static on the left, right? Well, everything is static on the left, right? On the right, it's more of a fluid situation. Now, not to redo the whole presentation I did five years ago, which I might do soon. I guess it's time to redo it. But the before is a little bit more of the new brain reasoning. Now, when I say new brain, old brain, I should have grabbed my brain, which I have in the um, in the closet. Maybe next week I'll I'll whip out my brain, <laughs> but I have a brain. And the down in the in the bottom of the brain, I think you know, here's your brain up here, and there's a little bitty part down here. Maybe like that would be like the amygdala and all the lizard brain stuff. Well, the new brain is what sits on top of it. It's what has evolved, okay? So the new brain is a lot of reasoning involved. As I said a second ago, it's your left brain. It's more logical, okay? Now, the old brain is more and often your, that's where your emotions come from, your old brain, okay? So you've got a little small part of your brain called amygdala. It fires off real quick. And I could never wrap my head around how could that little little brain 
control the big brain. <laughs> and I recently read something where if you have like a panic attack or something along those lines, what's happening is you're feeling something in your body that is sensed by that amygdala, which sends a signal over to your right brain, I guess, which is more emotional and has, it has you start to react and it becomes like a negative feedback loop. But the bottom line is that little part of your brain, which is very quick acting, as I've said before, when you're getting ready to step out on a curb and remember, as I said now, if the yellow ones don't stop, right? A taxi cab's getting ready to run you over. You could contemplate your navel and say, well, you know, what's going on with this guy? Why didn't he like me? Or what's happening here? Or you can jump out the way. Well, your amygdala sort of hijacks the rest of your brain and pulls you over. And as I've said before, one of the best things you can do, and I don't know if it's still on my desk. Oh, I can't reach it. But I have a little clock and I wind the clock. I used to at least, I need to remember to do that again. And that comes from the reasoning that I was explaining to Greg when he asked me what I was gonna talk about in a in a seminar that I was doing for Traders Expo. And he was he happened to be visiting in he was in New York. And I said, well, I'm gonna talk about how sometimes you just need a few seconds to not make a stupid decision. And he said, well, on the clock. And I'm like, what do you mean? He says, well, and, it, and I did later see that he wrote about in his book, uh, not dancing with the trend, but um, investing with the trend. But when he was a fighter pilot, when he was in the simulators, the, the idea of the instructor when you're in the simulators is to get you to panic and get you to make a lot of mistakes better to make them on the ground than in the air. And if you make too many of them, obviously you're never gonna get behind the stick, right? Anyway, in order to, and he, he like all the other students were young pilots, I guess, aspiring pilots, were having difficulty with all the alarms and bells and whistles going off that they're, when they're effing with you. And back then, the, I think he flew F4s, I forget, but anyway, uh, older fighter pilots, they actually had a fighter planes, they actually had an analog clock. And he would, when everything starts hitting the fan, instead of freaking out, trying to figure out what's happening, he would just take a deep breath and wind the clock. And when he later flew commercial airlines, he would kind of like metaphorically wind the clock. And one time he was telling me a story where an engine shut down or was, 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 causing problems and the co-pilot's like you want me to shut it down he's like no 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 you know and, and he took a breath and he metaphorically wound the clock you know touched the dash or whatever just to just to take a deep breath and said no don't do that because you might shut down the engine that's running and that would be a bad thing especially if we can't get it restarted to not have any engines on, on an airplane Anyway, the point is take a few seconds to assess the situation and try not to get too emotionally charged. And as I've often said, one of my big problems is if I'm looking at my screens and then I go in the house and have lunch or whatever, or breakfast even, and I come back in, all of a sudden everything looks looks great all of a sudden. I see something moving and, and I, I get a little too caught up in the in the flickering ticks which is, a, um, I think, Todd Harrison. I, I don't, I've never seen what Todd said that, but I never met Todd or anything, but uh, Dave Keller uses that term often. And all I really need to do is just take a deep breath, wait a few seconds, and that'll pass, and I won't make that emotionally charged decision. The right brain is a lot more emotional, okay? So you've got the old brain, and then you've got your right brain. Combination of these two are very, very emotional. And Steenbarger said, and it might have also been Curtis Faith, but one of those two guys said that when you're doing something in trading, try to take more of a whole brain approach and send it over to the other side to check it out, okay? And I never fully understood what that means, but as I'm saying it out loud, this is why I like teaching because I learned the process too, right? From a selfish standpoint, 
but it's kind of like, okay, where's my stop? Where's the, let's say the 30 day EMA or is there a Landry light or whatever? And instead of just jumping out of a position, maybe start looking at something that's a little bit more logical, okay? So maybe if I find myself getting emotional, like, oh crap, I'm losing money. And it's something I wanna talk about in a little while too, about not watching your equity, spoiler alert. But if you can send it over the other side and maybe have a check, check it out. Now, there's not a lot in trading that's like life. And I've done complete presentations just on the fact that trading is not like life. And the things in life that make you successful often will make you the worst in trading, trading okay? Um, doctors and lawyers and automatic transmission mechanics tend to make the worst traders. And I just say all three of those because that's my way of accomplishing. Basically, everyone makes the worst traders. But if I had to kind of list them, doctors would be pretty high up there. Engineers often can be the worst because they're too smart and they also try to apply logic to everything. And logic doesn't often apply when it comes to trade. But trading like life is just making decisions and living with him. And I often make a joke at my wife's expense, I'll spare it tonight. <laughs> if you see me in person speak, if, if this uh, stupid virus ever goes away, then you'll probably see the joke. Anyway, it's easy to make decisions. It's hard to live with decisions. And usually when I talk about this, making decisions and living with them, I kind of set it up with the fact that you cannot remove your emotions from trading. And that's Descartes and Scholl have done the groundwork there, some of the groundwork there. And I learned from Scholl, Denise Scholl, that you can't make any emotions in making, you can't reduce, you can't eliminate your emotions in trading, okay? You can be less emotional, but every decision comes with an emotion, okay? Uh, I'll give you an example. It's kind of like, you know, right before I'm coming in here, my wife knows I need to eat a little bit, keep my sugar up, doing these presentations, she made a pot of beans. You want some beans? I'm like, oh, that sounds good. You know, I'll get a little bowl of beans. Like, well, wait, wait a minute, I've got to go do a presentation. That might not work out so well, you know? So you had to go through these emotions of, ooh, beans would taste good, but the consequences of that decision. I know it's kind of a silly one, but a lot of little decisions, and you'd be shocked that once you start noticing this, how many emotions actually come into decisions. And that could be like a lunch decision or something, of course, much, much bigger. But you have to learn how to live with that decisions. And, you know, just to like the food thing, all right, not to, just to make it a little bit more simpler. It's like, I love po' boys, okay? If I go out and eat a po' boy, I know that it, I'm going to put on weight if I do that. doesn't mean that I won't ever eat another po' boy in my life, but I'll try to decide on when I'm going to eat them and how many or whatever, right? So it's a lot more to a decision than just saying, okay, I'm just going to do this or do that. And as I've said a thousand times, people who have been unfortunate enough to have injury or illness have and have lost that emotional part of their brain can no longer make decisions because there's no consequence. There's no emotion attached to that decision. And that's how we make decisions is we have emotions and consequences with those decisions. Now, again, making decisions is easy. Living with them is not. But here's a few things that might help. So I put easier in here instead of easy because it's never easy, right? The living with it part. And that goes for trading and outside of trading, obviously. Well, the big dog here is just make better decisions. I know, you know, drop the mic. Well, as it relates to trading, if you have a lot of confidence in what you're doing, then it's a lot easier to take the trade and then accept the outcomes. And paraphrasing Douglas, Mark Douglas, 
he said if there's any stress during the trade you haven't fully accepted the risk well there's always going to be some stress during the trade but let's just say if there's excessive trade excessive stress during the trade you haven't fully accepted the risk of the trade garbage in garbage out as i often say and you're going to get better inputs as you get confidence now if you're trying to trade six different methodologies and you've only been trading for let's say a few months or a year like one of you guys that are in there tonight hey george then how much confidence can you really have because how much time did you spend on this methodology and that methodology and that methodology and that methodology and, and all these other things so you really haven't really put the reps in at least not with just one single methodology and ideally one setup and once you do these things you begin to have some confidence and competence and what you're doing and you also learn to accept you also learn to live with that decision you also learn how to drop an f-bomb and move on the other thing is trust the process once you have the confidence and competence you're much more likely to trust in the process now as i'm going to point out in a minute if let's say you don't want to lose too much on a trade and you're not willing to reduce your your share size down but you put your stop within that normal volatility well guess what there's a 99.9 percent .9 chance unless you get really lucky that you're going to get stopped out so you have to accept the process of hey i'm going to need to give it a wider stop and and i'll give you like today little confession time i went after the e-minis two or three times and the third time i went after them after losing two trades in a row or scratching out at worst or one but i knew i had a couple losing trades i said dave you know what it looks like this market requires about a 30 point trailing stop which is kind of ludicrous i know but that's what the market called for and I had to accept that and I had to ride out the drawdown and be willing to get stopped out and drop an F-bomb at worst. Here's a big one. We could spend hours talking about this one alone, separating luck from skill. Annie Duke's book comes to mind, Thinking in Bets. I need to reread it. Uh, I recommend you do read it. I don't remember what her solutions were. And it's like, if you could figure out a way to separate luck from skill, write me a letter. We all tend to be guilty as human beings of when we make money, we feel like it was skill. And when we lose money, we feel like it was bad luck. And of course, a lot of introspection. And one way to get that introspection is to document, 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 document. And that means your trading journal and your emotional journal. And also, as I preach, and this will change your life, I, I swear to God it will, do your morning pages every day, you know? And this morning I wrote pretty much three pages just on the the FOMO versus POMO, and I only have maybe one page of that that actually made it into tonight's presentation. And I also talked about some of the things I've been doing right, and some of the things I've been doing wrong, and some ways for me to improve, and some of that I'll share with you. One of the things I've been doing to improve lately, and I've only been doing it for about three days now, is something I think I might have mentioned last week, is another one of those. And Dalio in Principles talks about another one of those. And if you think about it in life, you have a situation and you learn from that situation and you make a mental note of it, or even better, write it down. And then when that situation comes around again, it's like another one of those. And living the country and dealing with a lot of of people trying to get them to come out to the country and work on a house there was a lot of another one of those you know my 
my roofers were heroin addicts. <laughs> I had one guy that was going to paint the house. And uh, this was actually before we were in, in the country. And he needed $350 to go buy a paint or whatever. So he, uh, he brought an old ladder to the house, sat it down, collected his check, and I never saw him again. And then when I asked the guy who recommended it, he said, oh, he must be back on the crack. I'm like, why did you tell me that ahead of time? Anyway, we call it, uh, we still have crackheads Bob's Ladder somewhere. And whenever we, we need to do something, it's like, go get crackhead Bob's Ladder. But anyway, I there's no guarantee, but I'm pretty sure the next time I have some work done on a house, it's going to be, wait, this could be another one of those, okay? Although we did get a pool guy. They give a pool guy five thousand dollars, and we thought we'd never see him again. And he did come back. We should have made sure we had an escape clause, like, okay, you want us to pay you by then, but when are you going to start? And if you don't start by then, do we get our money back, or what happens? So another one of those. So getting back to trading during your post mortem, this is another one of those epiphany things. If you lost in a trade and you say, I do that again in a heartbeat. That's one of those epiphanies that you're 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 getting close to making it if you haven't already made it. And if you won on a trade, you need to really dig down deep and say, was it truly skill or did I just get lucky? And that other epiphany that can happen is you won on a trade, and instead of automatically chunking it up to chalking it up to skill. You say, you know what? I got kind of lucky on this one. I probably should not have taken that trade. I'm glad I have the money, but I'm not going to let the market teach me to take these crappy setups over and over again. Now, you'll never get it perfect. That's the thing about trading. And that's why the engineers sometimes have a hard time because perfectionists need not apply. I mean, if you're off by a fraction of a fraction or whatever on a bridge, it's probably not going to stay up very long. But in trading, you're never going to get it right, okay? But the bottom line is, what could you have done better? Now, as I said a minute ago, did you fail to adjust for volatility? And volatility is not what you want, but what's actually there. And many, many, many years ago, or trading markets might have been trade hard back then i wrote an article called the myth of tight stops tight stops seem to be universally preached now we're, i'm talking about position trading now but the reality is a lot of times i've fixed a lot of people so to say fixed so to speak and just by telling them to loosen their stops a little bit they'll show me a few of their trades i'm like well your stop is within the normal volatility and the market doing this is just going to take you out. And that's what I just was talking about with like the E-minis lately when the market, the volatility is starting to heat up a little bit in the markets. And yeah, you know, this is one of those things that's a real pain in the ass. You look at the market and it dropped 4% or a day or 3% or whatever the case may be. And you didn't make anything or you got whatever chewed up. And at the end of the day, it's like, you know, if I had just held on, closed my eyes and held on, not so you want to do that, right? I would have actually made really good money. But instead of just kind of like holding and hoping, adjust that stop to the volatility. And if you have to, reduce your share size down. Now, hindsight bias is, is something that the behavioral scientists are all over and the behavioral finance guys are all over. And, you know, one of my problems with all these books is they all start to sound the same, and they all sound like, uh, what is it, uh, Kahneman and Tversky, Thinking Fast and Slow. Do read that one. It's it's not a very exciting read. It's some really cool stuff in there at times, but it's it's a lot to get through. It's about that thick. And a lot of them have borrowed heavily from them. But there's a lot of good stuff in there if you could just, you know, work your way through it. But hindsight bias is one of the things they often talk about. And when you're looking back in time, as you do in the, pre, in the post mortem, as opposed to the time travel forward in the pre mortem, right? But when you're looking back in time, you will have the benefit of hindsight and you have to be careful with that. But what's amazing is you're going to see things that were plainly there that you didn't see 
at the time. And that might have been because you had some FOMO working before you went into the trade. And then once you were in the trade, you were kind of stressed out because of all those things we talked about earlier because of the two U's, your different parts of your brain working. By the way, the neurology I'm talking about tonight, the, the beauty of learning a little bit about, about neurology is that the, we all have a, a bit of a shared psychology when it comes to trading. And it's hard for a lot of us to admit that, but we, we really do. And that's kind of hard to wrap your head around, but it's a little easier to wrap your head around a little neurology because we all have kind of the same functioning brains. I guess we, we all have the same type of functioning brain, unless there's something wrong with you. <laughs> And it 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 operates in a certain way where before the trade it operates a certain way during the trade it operates a different way. The like I said, the old brain is quick to cause you to do stupid stuff. Okay, it also keeps you alive, right? And embracing these things and learning these things really helped. Now, at the least, is there anything blatant when you're looking back that was that's plain now, plain to see now that wasn't there? in the beginning and at the least take a look at the crash course on stocks left and i just grabbed this frame out of that if you look at the trading quick clips on my youtube channel again youtube.com slash c slash dave landry this was a presentation i did a while back and i parsed out this slide here's a few things to look for when you're dealing with stock selection and as I've said, ad nauseum, I spent 14 hours on a stock selection course, which I need to probably redo. I probably re would, would put the same exact thing back in it again. I don't think anything's changed content-wise. In fact, th this slide comes straight from it. The only thing that would change would be maybe a little bit better audio, a little bit better video, add some fresh examples. But other than that, it's pretty much the same. But anyway, just as one example, for instance, it's like this right here you know first pull back up to base breakout is pretty pretty damn good pattern of trade but a lot of pe times people will send me a stock that looks like this it's it's broken out but it's come all the way back in and they want to trade it's like no it's back in the range okay now one thing i've been really cognizant of lately and and documenting as much as possible is what thoughts or anguish did you experience during and after the trade? And, and you know, I guess with tonight's presentation, maybe even before the trade needs to be added into that. And that's where I started coming up with all this, like I've been saying, all, another one of those and all the things I've been talking about lately. And can these become a procedure or do these need to become a procedure? Okay. And is there anything that could help you with these issues? Okay. And I'll give you, for instance, if you go in and watch some presentations that I've done on the Holy Grail hunting, and again, you could find the quick clips. And if you find a quick clip you like, or like it, of course, and like this video if you like it. Uh, and if you don't like it, go have no fun somewhere else. <laughs> But if you go in and look at the quick clips, I talk about the Holy Grail days and a lot of the research I was doing there was like, you know what? Don't get chewed up in these narrow range bars. Wait until you have about 50% of the recent range and I can get the actual formula that I'm using on my trading station and post it in Facebook. And I've talked about it in those older presentations. But I know that unless I have about 50% of that prior range, a, a, a small range, a wide range bar, sorry, is going to start with a small range bar that got a little bigger. And where what I'm getting at there is, let's say the market just has a little bar about that big and goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. If you're looking at those flickering ticks, it looks like the bars are this big, right? And you're like, oh, here comes a bear market, there goes a bull market, you know? But the reality is at the end of the day, you're doing your post-mortem when you got chewed up and you're looking back and going, oh man, it's just a little inside day. And that's another thing too, inside days. If you're doing some intraday ETF trading, 
try to avoid the ones where it's an inside day, unless, of course, that range appears to be expanding. That's kind of a la Toby Crable type of stuff. Anyway, not enough time to get into all that tonight, but the videos are out there. So through recording your thoughts and your anguish during the trades, and, I, and anytime I yell the F, the F word, I almost said it out loud. <laughs> Anytime I yell the F word, I write down in my trading journal that I wrote that I yelled the F word. And guess what? When I just kind of follow along and do what I'm supposed to do, number one, I'm, I'm not always, but often profitable. And two, I have zero F bombs. If I'm dropping F bombs all day, then I'm doing something wrong. And maybe there needs to be a procedure for that. And by the way, you know, what I was kind of skirting around there or, or kind of backing into by accident, it's kind of like we're all excited about a trade. And a lot of times you kind of have to think about the opposite. What would stop me from taking this trade? Okay. How can I eliminate more bad trades? And of course, you always want to be positive, right? I was going to be a pessimist, but I figured it wouldn't work out. <laughs> right, what a W. But you always want to be a positive, positive in general, but you also want to seek out and play devil's advocate. Like, when does these things not work? Okay. So I know the S&P is doing this. So you haven't seen me, excuse me, recommend many core trades, core trend trades in a while. Why? Well, there's no trend. Okay. You can't catch a tan. If the sun isn't shining, as I wrote in the layman's guides to trading stocks, and you also, what's the also there? Yeah, you can't catch a tan if the sun isn't shining, and you can't catch a trend if there is none. Now, I'm a big fan of asking questions. And as I've said before in presentations, I think it might have been the stock charts presentation. For Stock Tours TV, I had a professor years ago in college, and he was a big little Asian guy, but he was big on asking questions. If you don't know the answer, ask a question. And it really stuck with me. And a lot of the things that are just, you know, written down over the last few days, and I'm I'm working into another one of those possible procedures, is just asking questions. And I don't have the answer for all this. And, and, you know, guess what? As a trader, you're never going to have all the answers, but you're going to get it more and more and more over time. You know, it's kind of like uh, a question might be, okay, well, if the range is less than 50%, when would it be okay to take that trade? And maybe it's an opening gap reversal situation or something like that. A couple of random thoughts regarding another one of those. I found it interesting when I was putting my notes on the computer and thanks to my screwed up hands, cubital tunnel and carpal tunnel and I don't know what else, I'm not gonna get it cracking. I've pretty much ruined my hands banging on these computers all these years. <laughs> I have a foot pedal now, I mean, you know, which I knew now what I didn't know then. I wish I knew then what I know now. But anyway, so I'm using a lot more voice recording and things like that. And when you're saying things out loud, you realize how much you really do repeat yourself. And I've had a couple of things in these, another one of those that where I wrote down the same thing three or four different times. And I need to hear those things again and I need to heed them. And like I said before, I showed my wife a column once and she said, I asked her what she thought, and she said, well, you say a lot of the same shit. <laughs> you know, I was a little taken back. And then the next day, I get emails from people asking me the same stuff that I've said a thousand times. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to keep saying the same stuff until you people get it. Well, maybe I'm doing the same thing to myself. I'm going to keep saying the same things until I get it too. One of the big things I've been doing lately is... I, I decided to play a game, and I think it did that on Tuesday was the first day. And I said I would not look at my equity, although I was doing the math in my head, 
but I would not look at my equity all day and I would only look at the charts. And to my surprise, I didn't micromanage myself out of trades. Now, Tuesday, if memory serves, was a nice wide range bar. I did the same thing today. And my life got a lot easier. I wasn't nearly as stressed out. I did free me up to do a lot more things during the day by doing that. And I think this goes for the trend trades as well as the intraday trades and just make it a game. And the game was don't look at the equity all day and see where you are. And it's interesting today, I thought I was having a, a flat day at best and I thought I was losing money and then I actually saw the equity and it was, it was, it was pretty good. Okay. I wouldn't, you know, it wasn't like I was, it wasn't thousands of thousands of dollars, like six, seven hundred bucks for a day trade or whatever. It was better than poke the eye. So I think it's some, I think there's something there and I've talked about this before. I've just never forced myself to do it. Uh, brains are better suited for the caveman. That goes, that's just the, as you read more about neurology and especially the behavior of finance as it relates to neurology and all, human kind has evolved or, or the world has evolved, I guess, technology and all this other stuff has evolved rather quickly, especially the last 100 years or so. But our brains are still stuck back 10,000 years. And that could be bad for the trader. And I've talked about that in presentations too. It's just some random thought that I had tonight. All right, let's uh, take a look at Dave Landry's Trend Traders. It's my Facebook group. It's free, but you have to be at least a gold member or a service member, which you get gold for free if you're a service member of DaveLandry.com. And it comes from George. And he wrote, for the first time, I didn't feel bad awaiting better market conditions. Amen, George. Very good. You're getting it. Okay. And if I had to explain trading in a word, I would say it's patience. If you wait and wait and wait and wait and wait until you get that F yeah trade, take it, and then go back to waiting, your life will be a lot easier. But there's a lot of problems that rear their ugly head. We're not wired to sit around and wait, as I preach ad nauseum. Especially if you were successful in your current or prior career, you have many years of that trading as Dr. J, the psychiatrist, who was a client of mine, it was explained to me. But yeah, the waiting, it's not easy. As Tom Petty said, he got it right. The waiting is the hardest part. All right, Crypto Corner. I just kind of barely updated the slide from last week and the week before and week before. So just a couple of couple of things I want to kind of highlight here. We've been in a bit of a bear market for quite a while here. And I would say take a look at Bitcoin and Ethereum to a lesser extent to see the general direction of the market, maybe like kind of see like Bitcoin, kind of like the S&P 500. Even, if, even though the S&P 500 is chopping around, it doesn't mean that I won't occasionally take a setup. I'm just not going to go after a lot of setups unless I'm really feeling F. Yeah. And I think that applies to crypto. I probably need to start a, a separate notebook just on crypto to see how many another one of those type of procedures can come from that. And one thing I've been paying more attention to now because the bloom is off the rose and everything's just not going crazy is I'm looking at the depth of the bid and the ask to figure out how much liquidity is in that market before I decide to go in or at the least use that to kind of figure out how I'm going to place my orders. And as I've been saying quite a bit, it, was a lot more fun to just buy all the ones that were going up and stay in the strongest ones as long as possible. But I think the bloom is off the rose and you're gonna see that a lot of these things are just headed lower. And again, the 30 EMA could possibly be your best friend. The other thing I was thinking about tonight with crypto is, not to confuse the issue with facts, 
But I think unless a whole lot more greater fools come in, I think people are beginning to grow a little tired and weary of some of these things. And I saw a YouTube, and I don't I don't remember how old the YouTube was, but but they they were big proponents of Bitcoin, just Bitcoin, and not the shit coins, S H Y T. And they pointed out that there's like 49 doggy coins, okay? I wasn't aware of that, but so I think that the bloom is off the rose and, and there's actually, some people are starting to confuse the issue with facts, but, or a kind of more of a reality check. And here's a, for instance, there's been a little buzz lately because some exchanges have picked up. Craig, are you here tonight? Who, what exchange just picked up? I know you, I thought you made a post on that or somebody made a post. And it might've been from Zero Hedge. And they said that about two months too late, these exchanges to pick it up. Shibu, Shibu Inu, and there's supposed to be some excitement there, and maybe this little pop here might have been that. But you can see, as a general statement, it's been in a downtrend for quite some time, and there's no longer all this excitement. Okay, so the bloom is kind of off the rose. Uh, just an FYI, anything in purple, I'm actually long. Red means I'm long, but have a stop in place. Purple means I have a stop and an initial profit target. Okay, and you can see. In some cases, I don't remember when I got in this one, probably gonna pull back to this EMA. Okay, so far so good there. This one might've just been, yeah, this one was just a bonafide little breakout in here, kind of the RS game, which I haven't been playing a whole lot lately because it hasn't been a whole lot of RS. This one was a pullback to the EMA and I'm just looking at it now. I haven't looked at it in a while. I can see it's failing miserably. Probably stopped out of that one by now, or at least half. This one was just a breakout, okay? And so far, it really hasn't followed through to the upside. It was also a pullback to the EMA. Nice little Landry light here, nice little pullback to the EMA. And if we sort them by RS, we could see that there are some that are headed higher, but I wouldn't bottom fish and rush out and buy these ones coming off of the lows. I would prefer those that are making new highs. And as I said earlier, maybe we're kind of back to mostly the core methodology. And you can see the other thing I want to point out too, like even though this is one of the ones that are headed higher, notice how many are below, the highs are below the 30 EMA. In other words, you have upside Landry light and they're just not looking so hot. So again, the bloom is off the rose, pick your spots carefully. Same thing I've been preaching for weeks and weeks. It's probably almost a month or so now. I've been talking about how these things, most of them are headed lower, but occasionally there's an opportunity here and there. Now, I was long this one, but I had some issues with it. It was getting kind of thin. And I don't know how I survived this spike down. I don't know if the spike was real. And for some reason, I, I but maybe I didn't have a stop in place. Maybe I made a mistake, and that might have been one of those lucky mistakes. But anyway, not a whole lot of excitement in crypto. Let me just go. Real quick back to Bitcoin and Ethereum. But that's okay. You know, maybe the market's gonna settle down and maybe there's gonna be some longer term opportunities and some nice trend trades. But notice that Bitcoin has been in a pretty serious downtrend. You know, one of the arguments, it, it, it never replaced currencies, it's too volatile. Well, that's true. And you know, one of the arguments was it was made like you you can't get your transaction done because by the time the transaction is done. It's changed so much. And, and I experienced that a couple of years ago where I tried to buy some silver with Bitcoin. I thought it'd be fun to turn an imaginary asset into something that was a hard asset, just kind of an S and G type of thing. But it was very hard to do and very cumbersome, cumbersome. But I think they're missing the point. Bitcoin, as it's also a title of a book, it's a pretty good read. It just kind of ended though, it's kind of weird. I was listening to the audio and I'm like, wait, did I miss that? They started talking about explaining things in the appendix or something like, did I miss the ending of this thing? <laughs> but it was digital gold and I'd recommend you listen to it. It's pretty interesting. Anyway, so I would see Bitcoin as kind of a digital gold, so to speak. And obviously it's in a pretty serious downtrend. There's no reason to 
as a trader at least buy it at this juncture you know i don't want to confuse the issue with facts but it does seem like i know that there were some whales that came in so to speak around 40k and you know everything that happens on the bitcoin like a transaction okay everything happens is reported on the bitcoin ledger so if somebody had the interest go and look on january 7th on that tail down and see if there were some whales or somebody coming in and buying it below 40. now i wouldn't base a trading system on that but it would be something kind of fun to look at i know you want a part of me right <laughs> but you can see so far in a downtrend um one thing that's been kind of fun and again you want a part of me right is i've been watching this 230 ema system go in again and watch the quick clips and and those things have been a godsend so far because people are like could you explain this to me i'm like i got a clip on that go in and watch it less than five minutes maybe less than 10 minutes and if they're a little longer i divide them up but bar one bar two two bars above the 30 ema put a buy order above it bam nice little pop higher okay bar one bar two sell would be right here and it hasn't been a perfect route lower you might have gotten shaken out but for the most part just following that stupid little simple system you know one of the earliest trend following more on things i've ever done long before i was called the trend following moron and you can get the again you can get off the quick clips on my youtube channel all right any questions on crypto before we shift gears and let me start uh let me start looking at these things. Volatility increase. Yeah, sometimes, uh, George, let's say the S&P 500, you might be able to go in and, and, and do an intraday E-mini trade, which, by the way, I suggest you don't trade E-minis, George, until you master the, the, the longer-term core trend trades. Once you get that mastered, then start looking at these profit centers, so to speak, okay? But if you're going to try to hold on to P's all day, a while back, you might have been able to use 10 points and then maybe 20 points, but now they're pretty darn choppy. And, you know, the other thing, too, is the nature of a downtrend market is usually different than an uptrend market, usually much easier to trade uptrends than downtrends. And that's because you have these sharp, short covering rallies. I mean, take a look at Bitcoin went from, well, hell, what was this right here? I was down, let's just say 40,000 round numbers runs up to 50 something thousand. And then, of course, resumes its downtrend. Okay. Hi, Dave. I hope you're well. Not having a good financial trading year so far, July 2021 to now. Down 15% so in strong defense mode until market turns around. I got too greedy slash confident after a good 40% last year. Well, yeah you know it happens to all of us i just was kind of bragging about my performance earlier this week and performance today but check back often it, you know whenever i start feeling getting a little full of myself or telling the wife to put a pool in the backyard or whatever <laughs> i like uh, john z often says you know whenever he's whenever he's itching to go buy a car he needs to check his ego you know so that's just a, that's just a cycle we go through and we have to live with it okay awesome thank you you rock thank you god saved me saves me more than once actions mean more than believe okay the future is distorted and driven by belief of how it should be and not how it is, I think. Yeah, and and that's the that's the I mean, you could probably go off on that. And that's what makes technical analysis work is the the pos potential, okay, for greater fools to come along. And technical analysis, at least the way I do it, is not mumbo jumbo. It's looking at a market and looking what people have done and based on what they have done, what they might likely do next, okay? So 
maybe if this market goes on to make new highs, everyone who got shaken out during all this iffy period in here might be looking to put money back to work. And what usually happens is they kind of go into wait and see mode. They wait, they wait, they wait, and then they pile in later and the market takes off and then corrects. And then you could look to get in after that correction. But there's a lot of things you can look at in markets to see what people are doing. And like us, like I was talking about earlier, one of the simple things you often see is, and I know you had a chart you were talking about on Facebook, and you pointed it out, so I'm not picking on you, but you pointed out there was a mountain of overhead resistance, and it was. And it's like, so when that stock gets back up to that overhead resistance, anybody who bought during that level is likely to look to get out at break even. Anyway, S&P 500 before we get down, it's up, it's down, it's up. It's a Jackie Mason market, okay? And if you didn't know anything about technical analysis, first thing you do is just go grab a bar, going back a month or two, and where was it, okay? Back in November, S&P was at, uh, let's see, 46 something, and now it's less than it was then, okay? So it's not making a whole lot of forward progress. I don't know which way it's gonna go on the camera as of late. But it's also not too far away. I think that was all time highs there, right? From all time highs. How far away is this? Can you do this? It's less than 3% away from all time highs. When the market is fairly close to all time highs, give the benefit of the doubt. But don't throw caution to the wind. Obviously, you have a stop in place just in case. NASDAQ not looking as good, right? Let's see. Just curious here. As of today, we are seven, seven and a half percent. Is that right? Off of all time highs. So that's not a good thing. I might have to put the TFM 10% system on this one, do a little analysis, maybe over the weekend, see where we are. And 10% might be a little high or low, I should say, for the NASDAQ. Might have to broaden that out a little bit. SP 500 uses. 10%. And, you know, it's another one of those things, that, things that's a quick clip. I was trying to get one a day out for a while, and then it became a lot of work with everything else. But I have a few more that I need to post, so just keep an eye on those quick clips. NASDAQ got kind of whacked, as you can see today, down 2.5%, down below the 30 EMA. Nothing magical about that as I preach, but something like Landry Light can help to keep you on the right side of the market. So I wouldn't rush out and buy the NASDAQ right now. Okay. And like the peas, it's all over the place and chop it around. So I think we're kind of in show me mode with the NASDAQ. Russell 2000 remains a disappointment. As you can see, it's headed mostly lower, but it's pretty choppy and it's down toward the bottom of its range. Let's look at a weekly chart real quick. You can see this range has been going on forever. Okay. So that's a bit of a concern. I sure would like to see it make some new highs. Speaking of new highs, though, energies today now was standing, probe to new highs, very overbought due to correct, okay? But doing okay in here, as you can see, nice little breakout intact. Oh, look, for those keeping score, bar one, bar two, look at that, bam. Let's see, that's a 30-year-old system I'm dusting off. It's pretty cool. Metals and mining have been kind of going up in here. One thing that could be helping out the metals and the energies is that the dollar has been in a bit of a slide as of late, finally. Isn't that weird how the dollar kind of hung in there and then now it's kind of waking up a little bit to this inflation? And you know, all you have to do is shop to see inflation. And I've been seeing it for a long time, you know? Like I said about a month ago, now it's $8. So it went up 50 cents, but the, the cream I like in my coffee, it's, it's Klein Peter cream. And you know, you, you go to pick up the, uh, the pint or whatever that comes in, <laughs> it weighs a ton. You go to pour it out, it's got a big glob of cream or butter on the top. You got to scrape through that to get it in your coffee. It's just absolutely phenomenal. She's like, your cream is seven dollars and forty nine cents. Now it's seven ninety nine a container, you know, for a pint. She's like, well, I like my cream. I'm like, I'll see you got your wine, you know. <laughs> There was a comedian once that said that, I was talking about his mama, wouldn't give him the cereal. <laughs> oh, baby, how cool with that? <laughs> foods, look at that, foods, bam. Doing pretty good in here, we might start buying foods. Foods are starting to act like momentum stocks, right? 
foods used to be something I just would ignore, but who knows? We might be buying foods soon, banks, okay? And by the way, value can become momentum. That's a whole nother speech. But we find that we don't look for the value. We look for the momentum. And sometimes that puts us in value stocks. You know, it's interesting. I'm in a coal stock. I always forget what it does. ARLP, been in it forever, up 100% or whatever. And uh, I'll post the trades if we, uh, next time I bring it up in here, actual trades, right? It was a recommendation to service, actual recommendation, right? And it's a coal stock. And I didn't realize it at the time it was coal stock. I, I guess I knew what sector it was in. I guess I just saw energy or something. Anyway, it just, it technical analysis led me to that stock, just like it led me to Academy Sports, which is a company I would never think about think about buying, but hey, the chart was there. Banks, I can't get excited about banks, but who knows? Look what's happening with banks. They've gone pretty much straight up in here for the last several weeks. And that might be because rates are getting ready to pop. And I guess rates helps banks. Anybody in banking here? The spread gets better, right? When rates are up. Take a look at insurance. It's also right around brand new highs. Yet here, a lot of areas though, wide and loose and choppy and headed lower like biotechnology. Let's take a look at drugs real quick. Drugs are kind of all over the place. They don't look quite as bad as biotechnology, but you certainly don't want to be trading the drugs right now. Somewhat shorter term, retail kind of all over the place, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. This is not a good market for the trend follower, okay? Now, but Dave, about a week ago you said it was getting better. It was, but now it's beginning to worsen again. Take a look at software. Big fat head and shoulders type of top here. I don't trade directly off that pattern, but it is good to pay attention to what's going on. Kind of take a 30,000 foot view sometimes. Semiconductor is one of my favorite areas. Kind of hanging in there, but chopping all over the place. Got absolutely cream today. I wouldn't say absolutely cream, but only down about 1.8%, but you can see they took off earlier and then imploded. All right, let's open it up for individual stocks. Any questions on anything we've covered so far? B-R-O-S. Uh, we say in bros related to something I was talking about, a losing trade or something, George, or you certainly don't want to buy this, right? Because it's in a downtrend. And, you know, as I said earlier, one of the simplest things you could do, and I just left this 30 in here by accident, is pay attention to that 30-day exponential moving average and don't buy anything as a general rule unless it's above the 30 EMA. So that's not trending, so I'd leave that alone. Yeah, it was a service and a setup. Yeah, now this one, bros didn't work. Bros was one, or did we play this pullback? I hope we played this pullback. I know that it was one that, yes, we played that pullback, I think. And I think we we went back to the well and it didn't work. So there, it was a great trade in here. It took off, it pulled back. This was an FEI trade, I remember when I saw it. But then unfortunately it failed miserably, but through money management and all, overall we did okay, I think on that one. And I hope that it was in the service in the first deep pullback. If not, I know we were talking about it in Facebook. And one of you guys actually has been to Bros. Your children have forced you to go there. Okay, this is an IPO, obviously. Let's see what we got here. Um, since I messed my screen up here. So I had to switch over to the, I call it the new TC, it's been out forever. Let's see, bar one, bar two, bar three, bar four, bar five. Yeah, that's a that's a buy at B. I like it, John, good eye. Uh, neuroscience, Virgil Neus, Neuroscience, hmm, interesting. Yeah, so this thing, any close, and I know it's kind of takes a leap of faith, but because the bar one high was taken out, and I wish I could more just a little bit where's the thing i can't find the deal anyway um yeah so right around let's say about 14 20 or so whatever this is anything over 14 actually is a buy so yeah i like that one good eye uh you get a high five tonight for that one that's a buy at b john's our resident ipo expert in the group tsn yeah, it looks good uh, on a pullback, sure. Might be ready to break out at resistance. I can't get my chart, so let me take a look at the short-term and long-term. Maybe this will work. Yeah, you know, 
I don't like. Um, well, what do I do? I don't have a scroll wheel. I don't have a scroll wheel. I've got one of these um, 3M mice. I don't know if you can see it on a camera. One of these ergonomic mice because my gosh darn hands hurt so much. But you can see uh, this is kind of wide and loose and all over the place. And it's also a brand new highs. Uh, I would, I would probably pass on that, but that is a food and it is going higher. So let's just see what happens when it when it pulls back. Okay. Yeah, thank you, John, for that suggestion. I just don't have a scroll wheel on this one. Okay. All right. Any more? Any more stock picks? Well, while we're in an impasse, I want to thank everybody for coming this week. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Anything unanswered, bring it up in Facebook if you're a member. And if not, you could always reach me at DaveLeonard.com slash contact. Everybody have a great holiday weekend. Uh, next week, I haven't decided on a show. Usually, it's a four-day week. There's so much going on and just not enough time and not enough material to get out a show. So I may take off next week, just an FYI on that. So uh, if I don't see you guys anytime between now and then, I guess uh, everybody have a fantastic weekend. Thank you so much.